Chapter 8 With the Spiritual Head of South India Someone draws up to my side before we reach the end of the road which is to take us into Madras. I turn my head. The yellow-robed yogi, for it is he, rewards me with a majestic grin. His mouth stretches almost from ear to ear and his eyes wrinkle into narrow slits. You wish to speak to me, I inquire. I do, sir, he replies quickly and with a good accent to his English. May I ask what you are doing in our country? I hesitate before this inquisitiveness and decide to give a vague reply. Oh, just traveling around. You are interested in our holy men, I believe. Yes, a little. I am a yogi, sir, he informs me. He is the heftiest looking yogi I have ever seen. How long have you been one? Three years, sir. Well, you look none the worse for it, if you will pardon my saying so. He draws himself proudly together and stands at attention. Since his feet are naked, I take the click of his heels for granted. For seven years I was a soldier of His Majesty the King Emperor, he exclaims. Indeed, yes, sir. I served with the ranks in the Indian Army during the Mesopotamian Campaign. After the war, I was put into the military accounts department because of my superior intelligence. I am compelled to smile at this unsolicited testimony to himself. I left the service on account of family trouble and went through a period of great distress. This induced me to take the spiritual path and become a yogi. I hand him a card. Shall we exchange names, I suggest? My personal name is Subramanya. My caste name is Ayar. He quickly announces. Well, Mr. Subra Manya, I am waiting for an explanation of your whispered remark in the house of the silent sage, and I have been waiting all this time to give it to you. Take your questions to my master, for he is the wisest man in India, wiser even than the yogis. So, and have you traveled throughout all India? Have you met all the great yogis that you can make such a statement? I have met several of them, for I know the country from Cape Camorin to the Himalayas. Well, Sir, I have never met anyone like him. He is a great soul, and I want you to meet him. Why? Because he has led me to you. It is his power which has drawn you to India. This bombastic statement strikes me as being too exaggerated, and I begin to recoil from the man. I am always afraid of the rhetorical exaggerations of emotional persons, and it is obvious that the yellow-robed yogi is highly emotional. His voice, gesture, appearance, and atmosphere plainly reveal it. I do not understand, is my cold reply. He falls into further explanations. Eight months ago, I came into touch with him. For five months, I was permitted to stay with him, and then I was sent forth on my travels once more. I do not think you are likely to meet with another such man as he. His spiritual gifts are so great that he will answer your unspoken thoughts. You need only be with him a short time to realize his high spiritual degree. Are you sure he would welcome my visit? Oh, sir, absolutely. It is his guidance which sent me to you. Where does he live? On Arunachala, the hill of the Holy Beacon. And where is that? In the North Arcot Territory, which lies farther south. I will constitute myself your guide. Let me take you there. My master will solve your doubts and remove your problems, because he knows the highest truth. That sounds quite interesting, I admit reluctantly, but I regret that the visit is impossible at present. My trunks are packed and I shall soon be leaving for the Northeast. There are two important appointments to be fulfilled, you see. But this is more important. Sorry, we met too late. My arrangements are made and they cannot be easily altered. I may be back in the South later but we must leave this journey for the present. The, the yogi is plainly disappointed. You are missing an opportunity, sir, and I foresee a useless argument, so cut him short. I must leave you now. Thanks anyway. I refuse to accept your refusal, he obstinately declares. Tomorrow evening I shall call upon you, and I hope then to hear that you have changed your mind. A conversation abruptly finishes. I watch his strong, well-knit, yellow-robed figure start across the road. When I reach home, I begin to feel that it is possible I have made an error of judgment. If the master is worth half the disciple's claims, then he is worth the troublesome journey into the southern tip of the peninsula. But I have grown somewhat tired of enthusiastic devotees. They sing pians of praise to their masters, who prove on investigations to fall lamentably short of the more critical standards of the West. 
Furthermore, sleepless nights and sticky days have rendered my nerves less serene than they should be. Thus the possibility that the journey might prove a wild goose chase looms larger than it should. Yet argument fails to displace feeling. A queer instinct warns me that there may be some real basis for the yogi's ardent insistence on the distinctive claims of his master. I cannot keep off a sense of self-disappointment. About the time of tiffin, that is tea, and biscuits, the servant announces a visitor. The latter proves to be a fellow member of the ink-stained fraternity to wit the writer Venkataramani. Several letters of introduction lie where I have thrown them at the bottom of my trunk. I have no desire to use them. This is in response to a curious whim that might be better to tempt whatever gods there be to do their best or worst. However, I used one in Bombay, preparatory to beginning my quest, and I used another in Madras because I have been charged to deliver a personal message with it, and thus this second note has brought Venkataramani to my door. He is a member of the Senate of Madras University, but he is better known as the author of talented essays and novels of village life. He is the first Hindu writer in Madras presidency who uses the medium of English to be publicly presented with an inscribed ivory shield because of his services to literature. He writes in a delicate style such merit as to win high commendation from Rabindranath Tagore in India and from the late Lord Haldane in England. His prose is piled with beautiful metaphors, but his stories tell of the melancholy life of neglected villages. As he enters the room, I look at his tall, lean person, his small head with its tiny tuft of hair, his small chin and bespectacled eyes. They are the eyes of a thinker, an idealist and a poet combined. Yet the sorrows of suffering peasants are reflected in their sad irises. We soon find ourselves on several paths of common interest. After we have compared notes about most things, after we have contemptuously pulled politics to pieces and swung the censors of adoration before our favorite authors, I am subtly impressed to reveal to him the real reason of my Indian visit. I tell him with perfect frankness what my object is. I ask him about the whereabouts of any real yogis who possess demonstrable attainments, and I warn him that I am not especially interested in meeting dirt-besmeared ascetics or juggling fakirs. He bows his head and then shakes it negatively. India is no longer the land of such men. With the increasing materialism of our country, its wide degeneration on one hand and the impact of unspiritual Western culture on the other, the men you are seeking, the great masters, have all but disappeared. Yet I firmly believe that some exist in retirement, in lonely forests perhaps, but unless you devote a whole lifetime to the search, you will find them with the greatest difficulty. When my fellow Indians undertake such a quest as yours, they have to roam far and wide nowadays. Then how much harder will it be for a European? Then you hold out little hope, I ask. Well, one cannot say. You may be fortunate. Something moves me to put a sudden question. Have you heard of a master who lives in the mountains of North Arcot? He shakes his head. Our talk wanders back to literary topics. I offer him a cigarette but he excuses himself from smoking. I light one for myself, and while I inhale the fragrant smoke of the Turkish weed, Venkataramani pours out his heart in passionate praise of the fast-disappearing ideals of old Hindu culture. He makes reference to such ideas as simplicity of living, service of the community, leisurely existence, and spiritual aims. He wants to lop off parasitic stupidities which grow on the body of Indian society. The biggest thing in his mind, however, is his vision of saving the half-million villages of India from becoming mere recruiting centers for the slums of large, industrialized towns. Though this menace is more remote than real, his prophetic insight and memory of Western industrial history sees this as a certain result of present-day trends. Venkataramani tells me that he was born in a family with a property near one of the oldest villages of South India, and he greatly lamented the cultural decay and material poverty into which village life had fallen. He loves to hatch out schemes for the betterment of the simple village folk, and he refuses to be happy 
whilst they are unhappy. I listen quietly in the attempt to understand his viewpoint. Finally, he rises to go, and I watch his tall, thin form disappear down the road. Early next morning, I am surprised to receive an unexpected visit from him. His carriage rushes hastily to the gate, for he fears that I might be out. I received a message late last night that my greatest patron is staying for one day at Jingleput. He bursts out. After he has recovered his breath, he continues. His Holiness Sri Shankara Archaya of Kumbakonam is the spiritual head of South India. Millions of people revere him as one of God's teachers. It happens that he has taken a great interest in me and has encouraged my literary career. And of course, he is the one to whom I look for spiritual advice. I may now tell you what I refrained from mentioning yesterday. We regard him as a master of the highest spiritual attainment. But he is not a yogi. He is the primate of the southern Hindu world, a true saint and great religious philosopher. Because he is fully aware of most of the spiritual currents of our time, and because of his own attainment, he has probably an exceptional knowledge of the real yogis. He travels a good deal from village to village and from city to city so that he is particularly well informed on such matters. Wherever he goes, the holy men come to him to pay their respects. He could probably give you some useful advice. Would you like to visit him? That is extremely kind of you. I shall gladly go. How far is Tingleput? Only thirty-five miles from here. But stay? Yes, yes. I begin to doubt whether his holiness would grant you an audience. Of course I shall do my utmost to persuade him, but I am a European. I finished the sentence for him. I understand. You will take the risk of a rebuff? He asked a little anxiously. Certainly, let's go. After a light meal, we set off for Tingleput. I ply my literary companion with questions about the man I hope to see this day. I learn that Sri Shankara lives a life of almost ascetic plainness as regards food and clothing but the dignity of his high office requires him to move in regal panoply when traveling. He is followed then by a retinue of mounted elephants and camels, pundits and their pupils, heralds and camp followers generally. Wherever he goes, he becomes the magnet for crowds of visitors from the surrounding localities. They come for spiritual, mental, physical, and financial assistance. Thousands of rupees are daily laid at his feet by the rich, but because he has taken the vow of poverty, this income is applied to worthy purposes. He relieves the poor, assists education, repairs decaying temples, and improves the condition of those artificial rain-fed pools which are so useful in the riverless tracts of South India. His mission, however, is primarily spiritual. At every stopping place, he endeavors to inspire the people to a deeper understanding of their heritage of Hinduism as well as to elevate their hearts and minds. He usually gives a discourse at the local temple and then privately answers the multitude of querents who flock to him. I learn that Sri Shankara is a 66, bear of the title and direct line of succession from the original Shankara. To get his office and power into the right perspective within my mind, I am forced to ask Bentakaramani several questions about the founder of the line. It appears that the first Shankara flourished over 1,000 years ago and that he was one of the greatest of the historical Brahmin sages. He might be described as a rational mystic and as a philosopher of first rank. He found the Hinduism of his time in a disordered and decrepit state, with its spiritual vitality fast fading. It seems that he was born for a mission. From the age of 18, he wandered throughout India on foot, arguing with the intelligentsia and the priest of every district through which he passed, teaching the doctrines of his own creation, and acquiring a considerable following. His intellect was so acute that usually he was more than a match for those he met. He was fortunate enough to be accepted and honored as a prophet during his lifetime, and not after the life had flickered out of his throat. He was a man with many purposes. Although he championed the chief religion of his country, he strongly condemned the pernicious practices which had grown up under its cloak. 
He tried to bring people into the way of virtue and expose the futility of mere reliance on ornate rituals unaccompanied by personal effort. He broke the rules of caste by performing the obsequies at the death of his own mother, for which the priest excommunicated him. This fearless young man was a worthy successor to Buddha, the first famous caste breaker. In opposition to the priest, he taught that every human being, irrespective of caste or color, could attain to the grace of God and to the knowledge of the highest truth. He founded no special creed, but held that every religion was a path to God, if sincerely held, and followed into its mystic inwardness. He elaborated a complete and subtle system of philosophy in order to prove his points. He has left a large literary legacy, which is honored in every city of sacred learning throughout the country. The pundits greatly treasure his philosophical and religious bequest although they naturally quibble and quarrel over its meaning. Shankara traveled throughout India wearing an ochre robe and carrying a pilgrim's staff. As a clever piece of strategy, he established four great institutions at the four points of the compass. There was one at Bandarat in the north, at Puri in the east, and so on. The central headquarters, together with the temple and monastery, were established in the south where he began his work. To this day, the South has remained the holy of holies of Hinduism. From these institutions, there would emerge, when the rainy seasons were over, trained bands of monks who traveled the country to carry Shankara's message. This remarkable man died at the early age of 32, though one legend has it that he simply disappeared. The value of this information becomes apparent when I learn that his successor, who I am to see this day, carries on the same work and the same teaching. In this connection, there exists a strange tradition. The first Shankara promised his disciples that he would still abide with them in spirit and that he would accomplish this by the mysterious process of overshadowing his successors. A somewhat similar theory is attached to the office of the Grand Lama of Tibet. The predecessor in office during his last dying moments names the one worthy to follow him. The selected person is usually a lad of tender years, who is then taken in hand by the best teachers available and given a thorough training to fit him for his exalted post. His training is not only religious and intellectual, but also along the lines of higher yoga and meditation practices. This training is then followed by a life of great activity in the service of his people. It is a singular fact that through all the many centuries this line has been established, not a single holder of the title has ever been known to have other than the highest and the most selfless character. Venkatara Mani embellishes his narrative with stories of the remarkable gifts which Sri Shankara, the 66, possesses. There is an account of the miraculous healing of his own cousin. The latter has been crippled by rheumatism and confined to his bed for many years. Sri Shankara visits him, touches his body, and within three hours, the invalid is so far better that he gets out of bed. Soon he is completely cured. There is the further assertion that His Holiness is credited with the power of reading the thoughts of other persons. At any rate, Venkataramani fully believes this to be true. We enter Chingliput through a palm-fringed highway and find it a tangle of whitewashed houses, huddled red roofs, and narrow lanes. We get down and walk into the center of the city, where large crowds are gathered together. I am taken into a huge house, where a group of secretaries are busily engaged handling the huge correspondence which follows His Holiness from His headquarters at Kumakonam. I wait in a chairless anteroom, while Venkataramani sends one of the secretaries with the message to Sri Shankara. More than half an hour passes before the man returns with the reply, that the audience I seek cannot be granted. His Holiness does not see his way to receiving a European. Moreover, there are 200 people waiting for interviews already. Many persons have been staying in the town overnight in order to secure their interviews. The secretary is profuse in his apologies. I philosophically accept the situation, but Venkataramani says that he will try to get into the presence of His Holiness 
as a privileged friend and then plead my cause. Several members of the crowd murmur unpleasantly when they become aware of his intention to pass into the coveted house out of his turn. After much talk and babbling explanations, he wins through. He returns eventually smiling and victorious. His holiness will make a special exception in your case. He will see you in about one hour's time. I fill the time with some idle wandering in the picturesque lanes which run down to the chief temple. I meet some servants who are leading a train of great elephants and big buff brown camels to a drinking place. Someone points out to me the magnificent animal which carries the spiritual head of South India on his travels. He rides in regal fashion, borne aloft in an opulent howda on the back of a tall elephant. It is finely covered with ornate trappings, rich cloths, and gold embroideries. I watch the dignified old creature step forward along the street. Its trunk coils up and comes down again as it passes. Remembering the time-worn custom which requires one to bring a little offering of fruits, flowers, or sweetmeats when visiting a spiritual personage, I procure a gift to place before my august host. Oranges and flowers are the only things in sight, and I collect as much as I can conveniently carry. In the crowd which presses outside His Holiness's temporary residence, I forget another important custom. Remove your shoes. Venkataramani reminds me promptly. I take them off and leave them out in the street, hoping that they will still be there when I return. We pass through a tiny doorway and enter a bare anteroom. At the far end there is a dimly lit enclosure, where I behold a short figure standing in the shadows. I approach closer to him, put down my little offering, and bow low in salutation. There is an artistic value in the ceremony which greatly appeals to me, apart from its necessity as an expression of respect and as a harmless courtesy. I know well that Sri Shankar is no pope, for there is no such thing in Hinduism, but he is a teacher and inspirer of a religious flock of vast dimensions. The whole of South India bows to his tutelage. I look at him in silence. This short man is clad in the ochre-colored robe of a monk and leans his weight on a friar's staff. I have been told that he is on the right side of forty, hence I am surprised to find his hair quite gray. His noble face, pictured in gray and brown, takes an honored place in the long portrait gallery of my memory. That elusive element which the French aptly term spirituel is present in this face. His expression is modest and mild, large dark eyes being extraordinarily tranquil and beautiful. The nose is short, straight, and classically regular. There is a rugged little beard on his chin, and the gravity of his mouth is most noticeable. Such a face might have belonged to one of the saints who graced the Christian church during the Middle Ages, except that this one possesses the added quality of intellectuality. I suppose we of the practical West would say that he has the eyes of a dreamer. Somehow I feel in an inexplicable way that there is something more than mere dreams behind those heavy eyelids. Your Holiness has been very kind to receive me, I remark by way of introduction. He turns to my companion, the writer, and says something in the vernacular. I guess it's meaning correctly. His Holiness understands your English, but he is too afraid that you will not understand his own, so he prefers to have me translate his answers, says Venkataramani. I shall sweep through the earlier phases of this interview, because they are more concerned with myself than with this Hindu primate. He asks about my personal experiences in the country. He is very interested in ascertaining the exact impressions which Indian people and institutions make upon a foreigner. I give him my candid impressions, mixing praise and criticism freely and frankly. The conversation then flows into wider channels, and I am much surprised to find that he regularly reads English newspapers and that he is well informed upon current affairs in the outside world. Indeed, he is not unaware of what the latest noise at Westminster is about, and he knows also through what painful travail the troublous infant of democracy is passing in Europe. I remember Venkataramani's 
firm belief that Sri Shankara possesses prophetic insight. It touches my fancy to press for some opinion about the world's future. When do you think the political and economic conditions everywhere will begin to improve? A change for the better is not easy to come by quickly, he replies. It is a process which must needs take some time. How can things improve when the nation spend more each year on the weapons of death? There is nevertheless much talk of disarmament today. Does that count? If you scrap your battleships and let your cannons rust, that will not stop war. People will continue to fight, even if they have to use sticks. But what can be done to help matters? Nothing but spiritual understanding between one nation and another, and between rich and poor, will produce goodwill and thus bring real peace and prosperity. That seems far off. Our outlook is hardly cheerful then. His Holiness rests his arm a little more heavily upon his staff. There is a God, he remarks gently. If there is, he seems very far away. I boldly protest. God has nothing but love towards mankind, comes the soft answer. Judging by the unhappiness and wretchedness which afflict the world today, he has nothing but indifference. I break out impulsively, unable to keep the bitter force of irony out of my voice. His holiness looks at me strangely. Immediately I regret my hasty words. The eyes of a patient man see deeper. God will use human instruments to adjust matters at the appointed hour. The turmoil among nations, the moral wickedness among people, and the suffering of miserable millions will provoke, as a reaction, some great divinely inspired man to come to the rescue. In this sense, every century has its own savior. The process works like a law of physics. The greater the wretchedness caused by spiritual ignorance, materialism, the greater will be the man who will arise to help the world. Then do you expect someone to arise in our time too? In our century, he corrects, assuredly. The need of the world is so great and its spiritual darkness is so thick that an inspired man of God will surely arise. Is it your opinion then that men are becoming more degraded? I query. No, I do not think so, he replied tolerantly. There is an indwelling divine soul in man, which in the end must bring him back to God. But there are ruffians in our western cities who behave as though there were indwelling demons in them, my counter thinking of the modern gangster. Do not blame people so much as the environments into which they are born. Their surroundings and circumstances force them to become worse than they really are. That is true of both the East and West. Society must be brought into tune with the higher note. Materialism must be balanced by idealism. There is no other real cure for the world's difficulties. The troubles into which countries are everywhere being plunged are really the agonies which will force this change, just as failure is frequently a signpost pointing to another road. You would like people to introduce spiritual principles into their worldly dealings, then? Quite so. It is not impracticable, because it is the only way to bring about results which will satisfy everyone in the end, and which will not speedily disappear. And if there were more men who had found spiritual light in the world, it would spread more quickly. India, to its honor, supports and respects its spiritual men though less so than in former times. If all the world were to do the same and to take its guidance from men of spiritual vision, then all the world would soon find peace and grow prosperous. Our conversation trails on. Now I'm quick to notice that Sri Shankara does not decry the West in order to exalt the East, as so many in his land do. He admits that each half of the globe possesses its own set of virtues and vices, and that in this way they are roughly equal. He hopes that a wiser generation will fuse the best points of Asiatic and European civilizations into a higher and balanced social scheme. I dropped the subject, 
and ask permission for some personal questions. It is granted without difficulty. How long has your holiness held this title? Since 1907. At that time, I was only twelve years old. Four years after my appointment, I retired to a village on the banks of the Calvary, where I gave myself up to meditation and study for three years. Then only did my public work begin. You rarely remain at your headquarters in Kumakonam, I take it. The reason for that is that I was invited by the Maharaj in Nepal in 1918 to be his guest for a while. I accepted and since have been traveling slowly towards his state in the far north. But see, during all those years I have not been able to advance more than a few hundred miles, because the tradition of my office requires that I stay in every village and town which I pass on the route or which invites me, if it is not too far off. I must give a spiritual discourse in the local temple and some teaching to the inhabitants. I broached the matter of my quest, and His Holiness questions me about the different yogis or holy men I have so far met. After that, I frankly tell him, I would like to meet someone who has high attainments in yoga, and can give some sort of proof or demonstration of them. There are many of your holy men who can only give one more talk when they are asked for this proof. Am I asking too much? The tranquil eyes meet mine. There is a pause for a whole minute. His holiness fingers his beard. If you are seeking initiation into real yoga of the higher kind, then you are not seeking too much. Your earnestness will help you, while I can perceive the strength of your determination. But a light is beginning to awaken within you, which will guide you to what you want without doubt. I'm not sure whether I correctly understand him. So far I've depended on myself for guidance. Even some of your ancient sages say that there is no other God than that which is within ourselves, I hazard. And the answer swiftly comes. God is everywhere. How can one limit him to one's own self? He supports the entire universe. I feel that I am getting out of my depth and immediately turn the talk away from this semi-theological strain. What is the most practical course for me to take? Go on with your travels. When you have finished them, think of the various yogis and holy men you have met. Then pick out the one who makes most appeal to you. Return to him, and he will surely bestow his initiation upon you. I look at his calm profile and admire its singular serenity. But suppose, your holiness, that none of them makes sufficient appeal to me. What then? In that case, you will have to go on alone until God himself initiates you. Practice meditation regularly. Contemplate the higher things with love in your heart. Think often of the soul, and that will help to bring you to it. The best time to practice is the hour of waking. The next best time is the hour of twilight. The world is calmer at those times and will disturb your meditations less. He gazes benevolently at me. I begin to envy the saintly peace which dwells on his bearded face. Surely his heart has never known the devastating upheavals which have scarred mine. I am stirred to ask him impulsively. If I fail, may I then turn to you for assistance? Sri Shankara gently shakes his head. I am at the head of a public institution, a man whose time no longer belongs to himself. My activities demand almost all my time. For years I have spent only three hours in sleep each night. How can I take personal pupils? You must find a master who devotes his time to them. But I am told that real masters are rare, and that a European is unlikely to find them. He nods his assent to my statement, but adds, Truth exists. It can be found. Can you not direct me to such a master? One who you know is competent to give me proofs of the reality of higher yoga? His holiness does not reply till after an interval of protracted silence. Yes, I know of only two masters in India who could give you what you wish. One of them lives in Benares, hidden away in a large house, which is itself hidden among spacious grounds. Few people are permitted to obtain access to him. Certainly no European 
has yet been able to intrude upon his seclusion. I could send you to him, but I fear that he may refuse to admit a European. And the other? My interest is strangely stirred. The other man lives in the interior farther south. I visited him once and know him to be a high master. I recommend that you go to him. Who is he? He is called the Mararishi. I have not met him, but know him to be a high master. Shall I provide you with full instructions so that you may discover him? A picture flashes suddenly before my mind's eye. I see the yellow-robed friar, who has vainly persuaded me to accompany him to his teacher. I hear him murmuring the name of a hill. It is the hill of the holy beacon. Many thanks, Your Holiness, I rejoin, but I have a guide who comes from the place. Then you will go there? I hesitate. All arrangements have been made for my departure from the south tomorrow. I mutter uncertainly. In that case, I have a request to make. With pleasure. Promise me that you will not leave South India before you have met the Mara, the Maharishi. I read in his eyes a sincere desire to help me. The promise is given. A benign smile crosses his face. Do not be anxious. You shall discover that which you seek. A murmur from the crowd which is in the street penetrates the house. I have taken too much of your valuable time. I apologize. I am indeed sorry. Sri Shankara's grave mouth relaxes. He follows me into the anteroom and whispers something into the ear of my companion. I catch my name in the sentence. At the door I turn to bow in farewell salutation. His Holiness calls me back to receive a parting message. You shall always remember me and I shall remember you. And so, hearing these cryptic and puzzling words, I reluctantly withdraw from this interesting man whose entire life has been dedicated to God from childhood. He is a pontiff who cares not for worldly power, because he has renounced all and resigned all. Whatever material things are given to him, he at once gives again to those who need them. His beautiful and gentle personality will surely linger in my memory. I wander about Put till evening, exploring its artistic old-world beauty and then seek a final glimpse of His Holiness before returning home. I find him in the largest temple of the city. The slim, modest, yellow-robed figure is addressing a huge concourse of men, women, and children. Utter silence prevails among the large audience. I cannot understand his vernacular words, but I can understand that he is holding the deep attention of all present, from the intellectual Brahmin to the illiterate peasant. I do not know, but I hazard the guess that he speaks on the profoundest topics in the simplest manner, for such is the character I read in him. And yet, though I appreciate his beautiful soul, I envy the simple faith of his vast audience. Life, apparently, never brings them deep moods of doubt. God is, and there the matter ends. They do not appear to know what it means to go through dark nights of the soul when the world seems like the grim scene of a jungle-like struggle. When God recedes into shadowy nothingness, and when man's own existence seems nothing more than a fitful passage across this small, transient fragment of the universe, which we call Earth. We drive out of Chingliput under an indigo sky gemmed with stars. I listen to palms majestically waving their branches over the water's edge in an unexpected breeze. My companion suddenly breaks the silence between us. You are indeed lucky. Why? Because this is the first interview which His Holiness has granted to a European writer. Well, that brings his blessing upon you. It is nearly midnight when I return home. I take a last glimpse overhead. The stars stud the vast dome of the sky in countless myriads. Nowhere in Europe can one see them in such overwhelming numbers. I run up the steps leading to the veranda, flashing my pocket torch. Out of the darkness, a crouching figure rises and greets me. Subramanya, I exclaim, startled. What are you doing here? The ochre-robed yogi indulges in one of his tremendous grins. Did I not promise to visit you, sir? He reminds me, reproachfully. Of course. In the large room, I fire a question at him. Your master, is he called Maharishi? It is now his turn to draw back astonished. 
How do you know, sir? Where could you have learnt this? Never mind. Tomorrow we both start for his place. I shall change my plans. This is joyful news, sir. But I shall not stay there long, though. A few days, maybe. I fling a few more questions at him during the next half hour, and then thoroughly tired go to bed. Subramanya is quite content to sleep on a piece of palm matting which lies on the floor. He wraps himself up in a thin cotton cloth, which serves at once as a mattress, sheet, and blanket, and disdains my offer of more comfortable bedding. The next thing of which I am aware is suddenly awakening. The room is totally dark. I feel my nerves strangely tense. The atmosphere around me seems like electrified air. I pull my watch from under the pillow, and by the glow of its radium-lit dial, discover the time to be a quarter to three. It is then that I become conscious of some bright object at the foot of the bed. I immediately sit up and look straight at it. My astounded gaze meets the face and form of His Holiness Sri Shankara. It is clearly and unmistakably visible. He does not appear to be some ethereal ghost, but rather a solid human being. There is a mysterious luminosity around the figure which separates it from the surrounding darkness. Surely the vision is an impossible one. Have I not left him at Chingliput? I close my eyes tightly in an effort to test the matter. There is no difference, and I still see him quite plainly. Let it suffice that I received the sense of a benign and friendly presence. I open my eyes and regard the kindly figure in the loose yellow robe. The face alters, for the lips smile and seem to say, Be humble, and then you shall find what you seek. Why do I feel that a living human being is thus addressing me? Why do I not regard it as a ghost, at least? The vision disappears as mysteriously as it has come. It leaves me feeling exalted, happy, and unperturbed by its supernormal nature. Shall I dismiss it as a dream? What matters it? There is no more sleep for me this night. I lie awake pondering over the day's meeting, over the memorable interview with His Holiness Sri Shankara of Kumbakonam, the hierarch of God to the simple people of South India. Chapter 9 the Hill of the Holy Beacon At the Madras terminus of the South Indian Railway, Subramanya and I board a carriage on the Ceylon boat train. For several hours we roll onwards through the most variegated scenes. Green stretches of growing rice alternate with gaunt red hills. Shady plantations of stately coconut trees are followed by scattered peasants toiling in the paddy fields. As I sit at the window, the swift Indian dusk begins to blot out the landscape, and I turn my head to muse over the things. I begin to wonder at the strange things which have happened since I have worn the golden ring which Brahma has given me, for my plans have changed their face. A concatenation of unexpected circumstances has arisen to drive me farther south, instead of going farther east as I had intended. Is it possible, I ask myself, that these golden claws hold a stone which really possesses the mysterious power which the yogi has claimed for it? Although I endeavor to keep an open mind, it is difficult for any Westerner of scientifically trained mind to credit the idea. I dismiss the speculation from my mind, but do not succeed in driving away the uncertainty which lurks at the back of my thoughts. Why is it that my footsteps have been so strangely guided to the mountain hermitage whither I am traveling? Why is it that two men, who both wear the yellow robe, have been coupled as destiny's agents to the extent of directing my reluctant eyes towards the Maharishi? I use this word destiny, not in its common sense, but because I am at a loss for a better one. Past experience has taught me full well that seemingly unimportant happenings sometimes play an unexpected part in composing the picture of one's life. We leave the train, and with it the main line, 40 miles from Pondicherry, that pathetic little remnant of France's territorial possessions in India. We go over to a quiet, little-used branch railroad which runs into the interior and wait for nearly two hours in the semi-gloom of a bleak waiting room. 
The holy man paces along the bleaker platform outside, his tall figure looking half ghost, half real, in the starlight. At last the ill-timed train, which puffs infrequently up and down the line, carries us away. There are but few other passengers. I fall into a fitful, dream-broken sleep which continues for some hours until my companion awakens me. We descend at a little wayside station, and the train screeches and grinds away into the silent darkness. Night's life has not quite run out, and so we sit in a bare and comfortless little waiting room whose small kerosene lamp we light ourselves. We wait patiently, while Dave fights with darkness for supremacy. When a pale dawn emerges at last, creeping bit by bit through a small barred window in the back of our room, I peer out at such portion of our surroundings as becomes visible. Out of the morning haze there rises the faint outline of a solitary hill, apparently some few miles distant. The base is of impressive extent, and the body of the ample girth, but the head is not to be seen, being yet thick shrouded in the dawn mist. My guide ventures outside where he discovers a man loudly snoring in his tiny bullock cart. A shout or two brings the driver back to his mundane existence, thus making him aware of business waiting in the offing. When informed of our destination, he seems but too eager to transport us. I gaze somewhat dubiously at his narrow conveyance, a bamboo canopy balanced on two wheels. Anyway, we clamber aboard and the man bundles the luggage after us. The holy man manages to compress himself into the minimum space which a human being can possibly occupy. I crouch under the little canopy with legs dangling out in space. The driver squats upon the shaft between his bulls, with his chin almost touching his knees, and the problem of accommodation being thus solved more or less satisfactorily, we bid him off. Our progress is anything but rapid, despite the best efforts of a pair of strong, small white bullocks. These charming creatures are very useful as draft animals in the interior of India, because they endure heat better than horses and are less fastidious in the matter of diet. The customs of the quiet villages and small townships of the interior have not changed very much in the course of centuries. The bullock carts, which transported the traveler from place to place in B.C. 100, transport him still, two thousand years later. Our driver, whose face is the color of beaten bronze, has taken much pride in his animals. Their long, beautifully curved horns are adorned with shapely gilt ornaments. Their thin legs have tinkling brass bells tied to them. He guides them by the means of a rein threaded through their nostrils, while their feet merrily jog away upon the dust-laden road. I watched the quick tropic dawn come on apace. An attractive landscape shapes itself both on our right and left. No drab, flat plain is this, for heights and hillocks are not long absent from the eyes whenever one searches the horizon's length. The road traverses a district of red earth dotted with terrains of scrubby thorn bush and a few bright emerald paddy fields. A peasant with toil-worn face, passes us. No doubt he is going out to his long day's work in the fields. Soon we overtake a girl with a brass water pitcher mounted upon her head. A single vermilion robe is wrapped around her body, but her shoulders are left bare. A blood-colored ruby ornaments one nostril, and a pair of gold bracelets gleam on her arms in the pale morning sunlight. The blackness of her skin reveals her as Dravidian, as indeed most of the inhabitants of these parts probably are, save the Brahmins and the Mohammedans. These Dravidian girls are usually gay and happy by nature. I find them more talkative than their brown country women and more musical in voice. The girl stares at us with unfeigned surprise, and I guess that Europeans rarely visit this part of the interior. And so we ride on until the little township is reached. Its houses are prosperous-looking and arranged into streets which cluster around two sides of an enormous temple. If I am not mistaken, the latter is a quarter of a mile long. I gather a rough conception of its architectural massiveness a while later when we reach one of its spacious gateways. We halt for a minute or two, and I peer inside, 
to register some fleeting glimpses of the place. Its strangeness is as impressive as its size. Never before have I seen a structure like this. A vast quadrangle surrounds the enormous interior, which looks like a labyrinth. I perceive that the four high enclosing walls have been scorched and colored by hundreds of years of exposure to the fierce tropical sunshine. Each wall is pierced by a single gateway, above which rises a queer superstructure consisting of a giant pagoda. The latter seems strangely like an ornate sculptured pyramid. Its lower part is built of stone, but the upper portion seems to be thickly plastered brickwork. The pagoda is divided into many stories, but the entire surface is profusely decorated with a variety of figures and carvings. In addition to these, four entrance towers. I count no less than five others, which rise up within the interior of the temple. How curiously they remind one of Egyptian pyramids in the similarity of outline. My last glimpse is of long-roofed cloisters, of serried ranks of flat stone pillars in large numbers, of a great central enclosure, of dim shrines and dark corridors, and many little buildings. I make a mental note to explore this interesting place before long. The bullocks trot off, and we emerge into open country again. The scenes which we pass are quite pretty. The road is covered with red dust. On either side there are low bushes and occasionally clumps of tall trees. There are many birds hidden among the branches, for I hear the flutter of their wings, as well as the last notes of that beautiful chorus which is their morning song all over the world. Dotted along the route are a number of charming little wayside shrines. The differences of architectural style surprise me, until I conclude that they have been erected during changing epochs. Some are highly ornate, over-decorated and elaborately carved in the usual Hindu manner. But the larger ones are supported by flat surface pillars which I have seen nowhere else but in the south. There are even two or three shrines whose classical severity of outline is almost Grecian. I judge that we have now traveled about five or six miles when we reach the lower slopes of the hill whose vague outline I had seen from the station. It rises like a reddish-brown giant in the clear morning sunlight. The mists have now rolled away, revealing a broad skyline at the top. It is an isolated upland of red soil and brown rock, barren for the most part, with large tracks almost treeless, and with masses of stone split into great boulders tossed about in chaotic disorder. Arunachala, the sacred red mountain! exclaims my companion, noticing the direction of my gaze. A fervent expression of adoration passes across his face. He is momentarily wrapped in ecstasy, like some medieval saint. I ask him, does the name mean anything? I have just given you the meaning. He replies with a smile, the name is composed of two words, Aruna, Achila, which means Red Mountain. And since it is also the name of the presiding deity of the temple, its full translation should be Sacred Red Mountain. Then where does the holy beacon come in? Ah, once a year the temple priests celebrate their central festival. Immediately that occurs, within the temple, a huge fire blazes out on top of the mountain, its flame being fed with vast quantities of butter and camphor. It burns for many days and can be seen from many miles around. Whoever sees it at once prostrates himself before it. It symbolizes the fact that this mountain is sacred ground, overshadowed by a great deity. The hill now towers over our heads. It is not without its rugged grandeur, this lonely peak patterned with red, brown, and gray boulders, thrusting its flat head thousands of feet into the pearly sky. Whether the holy man's words have affected me or whether for some unaccountable cause, I find a queer feeling of awe rising in me as I meditate upon the picture of the sacred mountain as I gaze up wonderingly at the steep incline of Arunachula. Do you know, whispers my companion, that this mountain is not only esteemed holy ground, but the local traditions dare to assert that the gods placed it there to mark the spiritual center of the world. This little bit of legend forces me to smile. How naive it is. 
At length I learned that we are approaching the Maharishi's hermitage. We turn aside from the road and move down a rough path, which brings us to a thick grove of coconut and mango trees. We cross this until the path suddenly comes to an abrupt termination before an unlocked gate. The driver descends, pushes the gate open, and then drives us into a large unpaved courtyard. I stretch out my cramped limbs, descend to the ground, and look around. The cloistered domain of the Maharishi is hemmed in at the front by closely growing trees and a thickly clustered garden. It is screened at the back and side by the hedge groves of shrub and cactus, while away to the west stretches the scrub jungle and what appears to be a dense forest. It is most picturesquely placed on a lower spur of the hill, secluded and apart, and seems a fitting spot for those who wish to pursue profound themes of meditation. Two small buildings with thatched roofs occupy the left side of the courtyard. Adjoining them stands a long modern structure, whose red tiled roof comes sharply down into overhanging eaves. A small veranda stretches across a part of the front. The center of the courtyard is marked by a large well. I watch a boy, who is naked to the waist and dark skinned to the point of blackness, slowly draw a bucket of water to the surface with the aid of a creaking hand windlass. The sound of our entry brings a few men out of the buildings into the courtyard. Their dress is extremely varied. One is garbed in nothing but a ragged loincloth, but another is prosperously attired in a white silk robe. They stare questioningly at us. My guide grims hugely, evidently enjoying their astonishment. He crosses to them and says something in Tamil. The expression on their faces changes immediately, for they smile in unison and beam at me with pleasure. I like their faces and their bearing. We shall now go into the hall of Maharishi, announces the holy man of the yellow robe, bidding me follow him. I pause outside the uncovered stone veranda and remove my shoes. I gather up the little pile of fruits which I have brought as an offering and pass into an open doorway. Twenty brown and black faces flash their eyes upon us. Their owners are squatting in half circles on a red tile floor. They are grouped at a respectful distance from the corner which lies farthest to the right hand of the door. Apparently everyone has been facing this corner just prior to our entry. I glance there for a moment and perceive a seated figure upon a long white divan, but it suffices to tell me that here indeed is the Maharishi. My guide approaches the divan, prostrates himself prone on the floor, and buries his eyes under folded hands. The divan is but a few paces away from a broad high window in the end wall. The light falls clearly upon the Maharishi, and I can take in every detail of his profile for he is seated gazing rigidly through the window in the precise direction whence we have come this morning. His head does not move, so thinking to catch his eye and greet him as I offer the fruits, I move quietly over to the window, place the gift before him, and retreat a pace or two. A small brass brazier stands before his couch. It is filled with burning charcoal, and a pleasant odor tells me that some aromatic powder has been thrown on the glowing embers. Close by is an incense burner filled with joss sticks. Threads of bluish-gray smoke arise and float in the air, but the pungent perfume is quite different. I fold a thin cotton blanket upon the floor and sit down, gazing expectantly at the silent figure in such a rigid attitude upon the couch. The Maharishi's body is almost nude, except for a thin, narrow loincloth but that is common enough in these parts. His skin is slightly copper-colored, yet quite fair in comparison with that of the average South Indian. I judge him to be a tall man. His age somewhere in the early fifties. His head, which is covered with closely cropped gray hair, is well-formed. The high and broad expanse of forehead gives intellectual distinction to his personality. His features are more European than Indian. Such was my first impression. The couch is covered with white cushions, and the Maharishi's feet rest upon a magnificently marked tiger skin. Pin drop silence prevails throughout the long hall. The sage remains perfectly still, motionless, quite undisturbed at our arrival. 
a swarthy disciple sits on the floor at the other side of the divan. He breaks into the quietude by beginning to pull at a rope which works a punka fan made of bamboo matting. The fan is fixed to a wooden beam and suspended immediately above the sage's head. I listen to its rhythmic purring. The while I look full into the eyes of the seated figure in the hope of catching his notice. They are dark brown, medium-sized, and wide open. If he is aware of my presence, he betrays no hint, gives no sign. His body is supernaturally quiet, as steady as a statue. Not once does he catch my gaze, for his eyes continue to look into remote space and infinitely remote it seems. I find this scene strangely reminiscent. Where have I seen its like? I rummage through the portrait gallery of memory and find the picture of the sage who never speaks, that recluse from whom I visited in his isolated cottage near Madras. That man whose body seemed cut from stone, so motionless it was. There is a curious similarity in this unfamiliar stillness of body, which I now behold in the Maharishi. It is an ancient theory of mine that one can take the inventory of a man's soul from his eyes. But before those of the Maharishi I hesitate, puzzled and baffled. The minutes creep by with unutterable slowness. First they mount up to a half hour by the hermitage clock which hangs on the wall. This too passes by and becomes a whole hour. Yet no one in the hall seems to stir. Certainly no one dares to speak. I reach a point of visual concentration where I've forgotten the existence of all save this silent figure on the couch. My offering of fruits remains unregarded on the small carved table which stands before him. My guide has given me no warning that his master will receive me as I have been received by the sage who never speaks. It has come upon me abruptly, this strange reception characterized by complete indifference. The first thought which would come into the mind of any European, is this man merely posing for the benefit of his devotees, crosses my mind once or twice, but I soon rule it out. He is certainly in a trance condition, though my guide has not informed me that his master indulges in trances. The next thought which occupies my mind Is this state of mystical contemplation nothing more than meaningless vacancy? Has a longer sway, but I let it go for the simple reason that I cannot answer it. There is something in this man which holds my attention as steel filings are held by a magnet. I cannot turn my gaze away from him. My initial bewilderment, my perplexity at being totally ignored, slowly fade away as this strange fascination begins to grip me more firmly but it is still not till the second hour of the uncommon scene that I become aware of a silent, resistless change which is taking place within my mind. One by one, the questions which I have prepared in the train with such meticulous accuracy drop away, for it does not now seem to matter whether they are asked or not, and it does not seem to matter whether I solve the problems which have hitherto troubled me. I know only that a steady river of quietness seems to be flowing near me, that a great peace is penetrating the inner reaches of my being, and that my thought-tortured brain is beginning to arrive at some rest. How small seem these questions which I have asked myself with such frequency. How petty grows the panorama of the lost years. I perceive with sudden clarity that the intellect creates its own problems and then makes itself miserable trying to solve them. This is indeed a novel concept to enter the mind of one who has hitherto placed such high value upon the intellect. I surrender myself to the steadily deepening sense of restfulness until two hours have passed. The passage of time now provokes no irritation because I feel that the chains of mind-made problems are being broken and thrown away. And then little by little, a new question takes the field of consciousness. Does this man, the Maharishi, emanate the perfume of spiritual peace as the flower emanates fragrance from its petals? I do not consider myself a competent person to apprehend spirituality, but I have personal reactions to other people. This dawning suspicion that the mysterious peace which has arisen within me 
must be attributed to the geographical situation in which I am now placed, is my reaction to the personality of the Maharishi. I began to wonder whether by some radioactivity of the soul, some unknown telepathic process, the stillness which invades the troubled waters of my own soul really comes from him. Yet he remains completely impassive, completely unaware of my very existence, it seems. Comes the first ripple. Someone approaches me and whispers in my ear, Did you not wish to question the Maharishi? He may have lost patience, this Kodum guide of mine. More likely he imagines that I, a restless European, have reached the limit of my own patience. Alas, my inquisitive friend, truly I came here to question your master, but now I, who am at peace with all the world and myself, why should I trouble my head with questions? I feel that the ship of my soul is beginning to slip its moorings. A wonderful sea waits to be crossed. Yet you would draw me back to the noisy port of this world, just when I am about to start the great adventure. But the spell is broken, as if this infectious intrusion is a signal. Figures rise from the floor and begin to move about the hall. Voices float up to my hearing, and wonder of wonders, the dark brown eyes of Maharishi flicker once or twice, then the head turns, the face moves slowly, very slowly, and bends downward at an angle. A few more moments, and it has brought me into the ambit of his vision. For the first time, the sage's mysterious gaze is directed upon me. It is plain that he has now awakened from his long trance. The intruder, thinking perhaps that my lack of response is a sign that I have not heard him, repeats his question aloud. But in those lustrous eyes which are gently staring at me, I read another question albeit unspoken. Can it be, is it possible, that you are still tormented with distracting doubts when you have now glimpsed the deep mental peace which you and all men may attain? The peace overwhelms me. I turn to the guide and answer, No, there is nothing I care to ask now. Another time. I feel now that some explanation of my visit is required of me not by the Maharishi himself, but by the little crowd which has begun to talk so animatedly. I know from the accounts of my guide that only a handful of these people are resident disciples, and that the others are visitors from the country around. Strangely enough, at this point my guide himself arises and makes the required introduction. He speaks energetically in Tamil, using a wealth of gesture while he explains matters to the assembled company. I fear that his explanation is mixing a little fable with his facts, for it draws cries of wonder. The midday meal is over. The sun unmercifully raises the afternoon temperature to a degree I have never before experienced. But then, we are now in a latitude not so far from the equator. For once, I am grateful that India is favored with a climate which does not foster activity because most of the people have disappeared into the shady groves to take a siesta. I can therefore approach the Maharishi in the way I prefer, without undue notice or fuss. I enter the large hall and sit down near him. He half reclines upon some white cushions placed on the divan. An attendant pulls steadily at the cord which operates the punka fan. The soft burr of the rope and the gentle swish of the fan as it moves through the sultry air sound pleasantly in my ears. The Maharishi holds a folded manuscript book in his hands. He is writing something with extreme slowness. A few minutes after my entry, he puts the book aside and calls a disciple. A few words pass between them in Tamil, and the man tells me that his master wishes to reiterate his regrets at my inability to partake of their food. He explains that they have a simple life and, never having catered for Europeans before, do not know what the latter eat. I thank the Maharishi and say that I shall be glad to share their unspiced dishes with them. For the rest, I shall procure some food from the township. I add that I regard the question of diet as being far less important than the quest which has brought me to his hermitage. The sage listens intently, his face calm, imperturbable, and noncommittal. It is a good object, he comments at length. 
This encourages me to enlarge upon the same theme. Master, I have studied our Western philosophies and science, lived and worked among the people of our crowded cities, tasted their pleasures, and allowed myself to be caught up in their ambitions. Yet I have also gone into solitary places and wandered there amid the loneliness of deep thought. I have questioned the sages of the West. Now I have turned my face towards the East. I seek more light. The Maharishi nods his head as if to say, Yes, I quite understand. I've heard many opinions, listened to many theories, intellectual proofs of one belief or another lie piled up all around me. I'm tired of them, skeptical of anything which cannot be proved by personal experience. Forgive me for saying so, but I am not religious. Is there anything beyond man's material existence? If so, how can I realize it for myself? The three or four devotees who have gathered around us stare in surprise. Have I offended the subtle etiquette of the hermitage by speaking so brusquely and boldly to their master? I do not know. Perhaps I do not care. The accumulated weight of many years' desire has unexpectedly escaped my control and passed beyond my lips. If the Maharishi is the right kind of man, surely he will understand and brush aside mere lapses from convention. He makes no verbal reply, but appears to have dropped into some train of thought. Because there is nothing else to do and because my tongue has now been loosened, I address him for the third time. The wise men of the West, our scientists, are greatly honored for their cleverness. Yet they have confessed that they can throw but little light upon the hidden truth behind life. It is said that there are some in your land who can give what our Western sages fail to reveal. Is this so? Can you assist me to experience enlightenment? Or is the search itself a mere delusion? I have now reached my conversational objective and decide to await the Maharishi's response. He continues to stare thoughtfully at me. Perhaps he is pondering over my questions. Ten minutes pass in silence. At last his lips open and he says gently, You say I. I want to know. Tell me, who is that I? What does he mean? He has now cut across the services of the interpreter and speaks direct to me in English. Bewilderment creeps across my brain. I am afraid I do not understand your question, I reply blankly. Is it not clear? Think again. I puzzle over his words once more. An idea suddenly flashes in my head. I point a finger towards myself and mention my name. And do you know him? All my life, I smile back at him. But that is only your body. Again, I ask, who are you? I cannot find a ready answer to this extraordinary query. The Maharishi continues, Know first that I, and then you shall know the truth. My mind hazes again. I'm deeply puzzled. This bewilderment finds verbal expression. But the Maharishi has evidently reached the limit of his English, for he turns to the interpreter and the answer is slowly translated to me. There is only one thing to be done. Look into your own self. Do this in the right way and you shall find the answer to all your problems. It is a strange rejoinder. But I ask him, what must one do? What method can I pursue? Through deep reflection on the nature of oneself and through constant meditation, the light can be found. I have frequently given myself to meditation upon the truth, but I see no signs of progress. How do you know that no progress has been made? It is not easy to perceive one's progress in the spiritual realm. Is the help of a master necessary? It might be. Can a master help a man to look into his own self in the way you suggest? He can give the man all that he needs for this quest. Such a thing can be perceived through personal experience. How long will it take to get some enlightenment with the master's help? It all depends on the maturity of the seeker's mind. The gunpowder catches fire in an instant, while much time is needed to set fire to the coal. I receive a queer feeling that the sage dislikes to discuss the subject of masters and their methods. 
Yet my mental pertinacity is strong enough to override this feeling, and I address a further question on the matter to him. He turns a stolid face toward the window, gazes out at the expanse of hilly landscape beyond, and vouchsafes no answer. I take the hint and drop the subject. Will the Maharishi express an opinion about the future of the world? For we are living in critical times. Why should you trouble yourself about the future? demands the sage. You do not even properly know about the present. Take care of the present. The future will then take care of itself. Another rebuff. But I do not yield so easily on this occasion for I come from a world where the tragedies of life press far more heavily on people than they do in this peaceful jungle retreat. Will the world soon enter a new era of friendliness and mutual help, or will it go down into chaos and war? I persist. The Maharishi does not seem at all pleased, but nevertheless he makes a reply. There is one who governs the world, and it is his lookout to look after the world. He who has given life to the world knows how to look after it also. He bears the burden of this world, not you. Yet if one looks around with unprejudiced eyes, it is difficult to see where this benevolent regard comes in. I object. The sage appears to be still less pleased, yet his answer comes. As you are, so is the world. Without understanding yourself, what is the use of trying to understand the world? This is a question that seekers after truth need not consider. People waste their energies over all such questions. First, find out the truth behind yourself. Then you will be in a better position to understand the truth behind the world, of which yourself is a part. There is an abrupt pause. An attendant approaches and lights another incense stick. The Maharishi watches the blue smoke curl its way upwards and then picks up his manuscript book. He unfolds its pages and begins to work on it again, thus dismissing me from the field of his attention. This renewed indifference of his plays like cold water upon my self-esteem. I sit around for another quarter of an hour, but I can see that he is in no mood to answer my questions. Feeling that our conversation is really at an end, I rise from the tiled floor, place my hands together in farewell, and leave him. I have sent someone to the township with orders to fetch a conveyance for a wish to inspect the temple. I request him to find a horse carriage if there is one in the place, for a bullock cart is picturesque to look at but hardly as rapid and comfortable as one could wish. I find a two-wheeled pony carriage waiting for me as I enter the courtyard. It possesses no seat but such an item no longer troubles me. The driver is a fierce-looking fellow with a soiled red turban on his head. This, his only other garment, is a long piece of unbleached cloth made into a waistband, with one end passing through his thighs and then tucking into his waist. A long, dusty ride, and then at last, the entrance to the great temple, with its rising stories of carved reliefs greets us. I leave the carriage and begin a cursory exploration. I cannot say how old is the temple of Arunachala, remarks my companion in response to a question, but as you can see, its age must extend back hundreds of years. Around the gates and the approaches from the temple are a few little shops and gaudy booths set up under overhanging palms. Beside them sit humbly dressed vendors of holy pictures and sellers of little brass images of Shiva and other gods. I am struck by the preponderance of representations of the former deity, for in other places Krishna and Rama seem to hold first place. My guide offers an explanation. According to our sacred legends, the god Shiva once appeared as a flame of fire on top of the sacred red mountain. Therefore the priest of the temple light the large beacon once a year in memory of this event which must have happened thousands of years ago. I suppose the temple was built to celebrate it, as Shiva still overshadows the mountain. A few pilgrims are idly examining the stalls, where one can buy not only little brass deities, but also gaudy, chromolithographs picturing some event from the sacred stories, books of religious character, blotchily printed in Tamil and Telugu languages, and colored paints wherewith to mark on one's forehead the fitting caste or sect symbol. 
A leprous beggar comes hesitatingly toward me. The flesh of his limbs is crumbling away. He is apparently not certain whether I shall have him driven off, poor fellow, or whether he will be able to touch my pity. His face is rigid with this terrible disease. I feel ashamed as I place some alms on the ground, but I fear to touch him. The gateway, which is shaped into a pyramid of carven figures, next engages my attention. This great towered portico looks like some pyramid out of Egypt with its pointed top chopped off. Together with its three fellows, it dominates the countryside. One sees them miles away long before one approaches them. The face of the pagoda is lined with profuse carvings and quaint little statues. The subjects have been drawn from sacred myth and legend. They represent a queer jumble. One perceives the solitary forms of Hindu divinities entranced in devout meditation, or observes their intertwined shapes engaged in amorous embraces, and one wonders. It reminds one that there is something in Hinduism for all taste. Such is the all-inclusive nature of this creed. I enter the precincts of the temple to find myself in part of an enormous quadrangle. The vast structure encloses a labyrinth of colonnades, cloisters, galleries, shrines, rooms, corridors, covered and uncovered spaces. Here is no stone building whose column beauty stays one's emotions in a few minutes of silent wonder, as do the courts of the deities near Athens, but rather a gloomy sanctuary of dark mysteries. The vast recesses awe me with their chill air of aloofness. The place is a maze, but my companion walks with confident feet. Outside, the pagodas have looked attractive with their ready stone coloring, but inside the stonework is ashen gray. We pass through a long cloister with solid walls and flat, quaintly carved pillars supporting the roofs. We move into dim corridors and dark chambers and eventually arrive at a vast portico which stands in the outer court of this ancient fane. The Hall of a Thousand Pillars announces my guide as I gaze at the time-grade structure. A serried row of flat, carved, gigantic stone columns stretches before me. The place is lonely and deserted. Its monstrous pillars loom mysteriously out of the semi-gloom. I approach them more closely to study the old carvings which line many of their faces. Each pillar is composed of a single block of stone, and even the roof which it supports is composed of large pieces of flat stone. Once again I see gods and goddesses disporting themselves with the help of the sculptor's art. Once again, the carved faces of animals, familiar and unfamiliar, stare at me. We wander on across the flagstones of these pillared galleries, pass through the dark passages lit here and there by small bowl lamps, whose wicks are sunk in castor oil, and thus arrive near a central enclosure. It is pleasant to emerge once again in the bright sunshine as we cross over to the enclosure. One can now observe the five shorter pagodas, which dot the interior of the temple. They are formed precisely like the pyramidal towers which mark the entrance gateways in the high wall quadrangle. I examine the one which stands near us and arrive at the conclusion that it is built of brick and that its decorated surface is not really stone carved but modeled out of baked clay or some durable plaster. Some of the figures have evidently been picked out with paint but the colors have now faded. We enter the enclosure, and after wandering through some more long, dark passages in this stupendous temple, my guide warns me that we are approaching the central shrine, where European feet may not walk. But though the Holy of Holies is forbidden to the infidel, yet the latter is allowed to catch a glimpse from a dark corridor which leads to the threshold. As if to confirm his warning, I hear the beating of drums, the banging of gongs, and the droning incantations of priests mingling into a monotonous rhythm that sounds rather eerie in the darkness of the old sanctuary. I take my glimpse, expectantly. Out of the gloom there rises a golden flame set before an idol, two or three dim altar lights, and the sight of a few worshippers engaged in some ritual. I cannot distinguish the forms of the priestly musicians, but now I hear the conch horn and the cymbal add their harsh, weird notes to the music. 
My companion whispers that it would be better for me not to stay any longer, as my presence will be decidedly unwelcome to the priests. Thereupon we withdraw into the somnolent sanctity of the other parts of the temple. My expiration is at an end. When we reach the gateway once more, I have to step aside because an elderly Brahmin sits on the ground in the middle of the path with a little brass water jug beside him. He paints a gaudy cast mark on his forehead, holding a broken bit of mirror in his left hand. The red and white trident, which presently appears upon his brow, sign of an orthodox Hindu of the South, gives him in Western eyes the grotesque appearance of a clown. A shriveled old man, who sits in a booth by the temple gate and sells little images of holy Shiva, raises his eyes to meet mine, and I pause to buy something at his unuttered request. Somewhere in the far end of the township, I espy the gleaming whiteness of a marble minaret, so I leave the temple and drive to the local mosque. Something inside me always thrills to the graceful arches of a mosque and to the delicate beauty of cupolas. Once again I remove my shoes and enter the charming white building. How well it has been planned, for its vaulted height inevitably elevates one's mood. There are few worshippers present. They sit, kneel, or prostrate themselves upon their small, colorful prayer rugs. There are no mysterious shrines here, no gaudy images, for the prophet has written that nothing shall come between a man and God, not even a priest. All worshippers are equal before the face of Allah. There is neither priest nor pundit, no hierarchy of superior beings to interlope themselves in a man's thought when he turns towards Mecca. As we return through the main street, I note the money changers' booths, the sweetmeat stalls, the cloth merchant's shop, and the sellers of grain and rice, all existing for the benefit of pilgrims to the ancient sanctuary, which has called the place into being. I am now eager to get back to the Maharishi, and the driver urges his pony to cover the distance which lies before us at a rapid pace. I turn my head and take a final glimpse of the temple of Arunachala. The nine sculptured towers rise like pylons into the air. They speak to me of the patient toil in the name of God, which has gone into the making of the old temple, for it has undoubtedly taken more than a man's lifetime to construct. And again that queer reminiscence of Egypt penetrates my mind. Even the domestic architecture of the streets possesses an Egyptian character in the low houses and thick walls. Shall a day ever come when these temples will be abandoned, left silent and deserted, to crumble slowly into the red and gray dust whence they have emerged? Or will man find new gods and build new fanes wherein to worship them? While our pony gallops along the road towards the hermitage which lies on one of the slopes of yonder rock-strewn hill, I realize with a catch in my breath that nature is unrolling an entire pageant of beauty before our eyes. How often have I waited for this hour in the east, when the sun with such splendor goes to rest upon its bed of night. An oriental sunset holds the heart with its lovely play of vivid colors. And yet the whole event is over so quickly, in a fair of less than half an hour. Those lingering autumnal evenings of Europe are almost unknown here. Out in the west, a great flaming ball of fire begins its visible descent into the jungle. It assumes the most striking orange hue as a prelude to its rapid disappearance from the vault of heaven. The sky around it takes on all the colors of the spectrum providing our eyes with an artistic feast which no painter could ever provide. The fields and groves around us have entered into an entranced stillness. No more can the chirping of little birds be heard. The chutter of wild monkeys has come to an end. The giant circle of red fires is quickly fading into some other dimension. Evening's curtain falls thicker yet and soon the whole panorama of thrusting tongues of flame and outspread colors sinks away into darkness. The calmness sinks into my thoughts. The loveliness of it all touches my heart. How can one forget these benign minutes which the fates have portioned us? 
when they make us play with the thought that under the cruel face of life, a benevolent and beautiful power may yet be hiding. These minutes put our commonplace hours to shame. Out of the dark void, they come like meteors, to light a transient trail of hope and then to pass away from our ken. Fireflies whirl about the hermitage garden, drawing strange patterns of light in the background of darkness as we drive into the palm-fringed courtyard. And when I enter the long hall and drop to a seat on the floor, a sublime silence appears to have reached this place and pervaded the air. The assembled company squats in rows around the hall, but among them there is no noise and no talk. Upon the corner couch sits the Maharishi, his feet folded beneath him, his hands resting unconcernedly upon his knees. His figure strikes me anew as being simple, modest, yet withal it is dignified and impressive. His head is nobly poised, like the head of some Homeric sage. His eyes gaze immovably towards the far end of the hall. That strange steadiness of sight is as puzzling as ever. Has he been merely watching through the window the last rays of light fade out of the sky? Or is he so wrapped in some dreamlike abstraction as to see naught of this material world at all? The usual cloud of incense floats among the wooden rafters of the roof. I settle down and try to fix my eyes on the Maharishi. But after a while feel a delicate urge to close them. It is not long before I fall into a half-sleep lulled by the intangible peace which, in the sage's proximity, begins to penetrate me more deeply. Ultimately, there comes a gap in my consciousness, and then I experience a vivid dream. It seems that I become a little boy of five. I stand on a rough path which winds up and around the sacred hill of Arunachala, and hold the Maharishi's hand. But now he is a great towering figure at my side, for he seems to have grown to giant size. He leads me away from the hermitage and, despite the impenetrable darkness of the night, guides me along the path which we both slowly walk together. After a while, the stars and the moon conspire to bestow a faint light upon our surroundings. I notice that the Maharishi carefully guides me around fissures in the rocky soil and between monstrous boulders that are shakily perched. The hill is steep and our ascent is slow. Hidden in narrow clefts between the rocks and boulders or sheltered by clusters of low bushes, tiny hermitages and inhabited caves come into view. As we pass by, the inhabitants emerge to greet us, and although their forms take on a ghostly appearance in the starlight, I recognize that they are yogis of varying kinds. We never stop for them, but continue to walk until the top of the peak is reached. We halt at last, my heart throbbing with the strange anticipation of some momentous event about to befall me. The Maharishi turns and looks down into my face. I, in turn, gaze expectantly up at him. I become aware of a mysterious change taking place with great rapidity in my heart and mind. The old motives which have lured me on begin to desert me. The urgent desires which have sent my feet hither and thither vanish with incredible swiftness. The dislikes, misunderstandings, coldnesses, and selfishness, which have marked my dealings with many of my fellows, collapse into the abyss of nothingness. An untellable peace falls upon me, and I know now that there is nothing further that I shall ask from life. Suddenly the Maharishi bids me turn my gaze away to the bottom of the hill. I obediently do so and to my astonishment discovered that the western hemisphere of our globe lies stretched out far below. It is crowded with millions of people. I can vaguely discern them, as masses of forms, but the night's darkness still enshrouds them. The sage's voice comes to my ears, his words slowly uttered. When you go back there, you shall have this peace which you now feel, but its price will be that you shall henceforth cast aside the idea that you are this body or this brain. When this peace will flow into you, then you shall have to forget your own self, for you will have turned your life over to that. And the Maharishi places one end of a thread of silver light in my hand. 
I awaken from that extraordinarily vivid dream with the sense of its penetrating sublimity yet upon me. Immediately the Maharishi's eyes meet mine. His face is now turned in my direction, and he is looking fixedly into my eyes. What lies behind that dream? For the desires and bitternesses of personal life fade for a while into oblivion. That condition of lofty indifference to self and profound pity for my fellows, which I have dreamt into being, does not take its departure even though I am now awake. Tis a strange experience. But if the dream has any verity in it, then the thing will not last. It is not yet for me. How long have I been sunk in dream? For everyone in the hall now begins to rise and to prepare for sleep. I must perforce. Follow the example. It is too stuffy to sleep in that long, sparsely ventilated hall, so I choose the courtyard. A tall, great-bearded disciple brings me a lantern and advises me to keep it burning throughout the night. There is a possibility of unwelcome visitors, such as snakes and even cheetahs, but they are likely to keep clear of light. The earth is baked hard, and I possess no mattress, with the result that I do not fall asleep for some hours. But no matter, I have enough to think over, for I feel that in the Maharishi I have met the most mysterious personality whom life has yet brought within the orbit of my experience. The sage seems to carry something of a great moment to me, yet I cannot easily determine its precise nature. It is intangible, imponderable, perhaps spiritual. Each time I think of him, tonight, each time I remember that vivid dream, a peculiar sensation pierces me and causes my heart to throb with vague but lofty expectations. During the ensuing days, I endeavor to get into closer contact with the Maharishi, but fail. There are three reasons for this failure. The first arises naturally out of his own reserved nature, his obvious dislike of argument and discussion, his stolid indifference to one's beliefs and opinions. It becomes perfectly obvious that the sage has no wish to convert anyone to his own ideas, whatever they may be, and no desire to add a single person to his following. The second cause is certainly a strange one, but nevertheless it exists. Since the evening of that peculiar dream, I feel a great awe whenever I enter his presence. The questions which would otherwise come chatteringly from my lips are hushed because it seems almost sacrilege to regard him as a person with whom one can talk and argue on an equal plane, so far as common humanity is concerned. The third cause of my failure is simple enough. Almost always there are several other persons present in the hall, and I feel disinclined to bring out my private thoughts in their presence. After all, I am a stranger to them and a foreigner in this district. That I voice a different language to some of them is a fact of little import, but that I possess a cynical, skeptical outlook, unstirred by religious emotion, is a fact of much import when I attempt to give utterance to that outlook. I have no desire to hurt their pious susceptibilities. But I have also no desire to discuss matters from an angle which makes little appeal to me. So, to some extent, this thing makes me tongue-tied. It is not easy to find a smooth way across all three barriers. Several times I am on the point of putting a question to the Maharishi, but one of the three factors intervenes to cause my failure. My proposed weekend quickly passes and I extend it to a week. The first conversation which I have had with the Maharishi, worthy of the same, is likewise the last. Beyond one or two quite perfunctory and conventional scraps of talk, I find myself unable to get to grips with the man. The week passes and I extend it to a fortnight. Each day I sense the beautiful peace of the sage's mental atmosphere, the serenity which pervades the very air around him. The last day of my visit arrives and yet I am no closer to him. My stay has been a tantalizing mixture of sublime moods and disappointing failures to affect any worthwhile personal contact with the Maharishi. I look around the hall and feel a slight despondency. Most of these men speak a different language, both outwardly and inwardly. 
How can I hope to come closer to them? I look at the sage himself. He sits there on Olympian heights and watches the panorama of life as one apart. There is a mysterious property in this man which differentiates him from all others I have met. I feel somehow that he does not belong to us, the human race, so much as he belongs to nature, to the solitary peak which rises abruptly behind the hermitage, to the rough track of jungle which stretches away into distant forests, and to the impenetrable sky which fills all space. Something of the stony, motionless quality of lonely Arunachala seems to have entered into the Maharishi. I have learnt that he has lived on the hill for thirty years, and refuses to leave it even for a single short journey. Such a close association must inevitably have its effects on a man's character. I know that he loves this hill, for someone has translated a few lines of a charming but pathetic poem which the sage has written to express this love. Just as this isolated hill rises out of the jungle's edge and rears its squat head to the sky, so does this strange man raise his own head in solitary grandeur, nay, in uniqueness, out of the jungle of common humanity. Just as Arunachula, hill of the sacred beacon, stands aloof, apart from the irregular chain of hills which girdles the entire landscape, so does the Maharishi remain mysteriously aloof even when surrounded by his own devotees, men who have loved him and lived near him for years. The impersonal, impenetrable quality of all nature, so peculiarly exemplified in this sacred mountain, has somehow entered into him. It has segregated him from his weaker fellows, perhaps forever. Sometimes I catch myself wishing that he would be a little more human a little more susceptible to what seems so normal to us, but so like feeble failings when exhibited in his impersonal presence. And yet, if he has really attained to some sublime realization beyond the common, how can one expect him to do so without passing beyond man, without leaving his laggard race behind forever? Why is it that under his strange glance, I invariably experience a peculiar expectancy? as though some stupendous revelation will soon be made to me. Yet beyond the moods of palpable serenity and the dream which stars itself in the sky of memory, no verbal or other revelation has been communicated to me. I feel somewhat desperate at the pressure of time, almost a fortnight gone, and only a single talk that means anything. Even the abruptness in the sage's voice has helped me, metaphorically, to keep me off. This unwanted reception is also unexpected, for I have not forgotten the glowing inducements to come here, with which the yellow-robed holy man plied me. The tantalizing thing is that I want this age above all other men to loosen his tongue for me, because a single thought has somehow taken possession of my mind. I do not obtain it by any process of ratiocination. It comes unbidden entirely of its own. This man has freed himself from all problems, and no woe can touch him. Such is the purport of this dominating thought. I resolve to make a fresh attempt to force my questions into voice and to engage the Maharishi in answer to them. I go out to one of his old disciples who is doing some work in the adjoining cottage and who has been exceedingly kind to me and tell him earnestly of my wish to have a final chat with his master. I confess that I feel too shy to tackle the sage myself. The disciple smiles compassionately. He leaves me and soon returns with the news that his master will be very pleased to grant the interview. I hasten back to the hall and sit down conveniently near the divan. The Maharishi turns his face immediately, his mouth relaxing into a pleasant greeting. Straight away I feel at ease and begin to question him. The yogis say that one must renounce this world and go off into secluded jungles or mountains if one wishes to find truth. Such things can hardly be done in the West. Our lives are so different. Do you agree with the yogis? The Maharishi turns to a Brahmin disciple of courtly countenance. The latter translates his answer to me. The life of action need not be renounced. If you will meditate for an hour or two every day, you can then carry on with your duties. 
If you meditate in the right manner, then the current of mind and deuce will continue to flow even in the midst of your work. It is as though there were two ways of expressing the same idea. The same line which you take in meditation will be expressed in your activities. What will be the result of doing that? As you go on, you will find that your attitude towards people, events, and objects will gradually change. Your actions will tend to follow your meditations of their own accord. Then you do not agree with the yogis. I try to pin him down. But the Maharishi eludes a direct answer. A man should surrender the personal selfishness which binds him to this world. Giving up the false self is the true renunciation. How is it possible to become selfless while leading a life of worldly activity? There is no conflict between work and wisdom. Do you mean that one can continue all the old activities in one's profession, for instance, and at the same time get enlightenment? Why not? But in that case, one will not think that it is the old personality which is doing the work, because one's consciousness will gradually become transferred until it is centered in that which is beyond the little self. If a person is engaged in work, there will be little time left for him to meditate. The Maharishi seems quite unperturbed at my poser. Setting apart time for meditation is only for the merest spiritual novices, he replies. A man who is advancing will begin to enjoy the deeper beatitude, whether he is at work or not. While his hands are in society, he keeps his head cool in solitude. Then you do not teach the way of yoga. The yogi tries to drive his mind to the goal, as a cowherd drives a bull with the stick. But on this path, the seeker coaxes the bull by holding out a handful of grass. How is that done? You have to ask yourself the question, who am I? This investigation will lead in the end to the discovery of something within you which is behind the mind. Solve that great problem, and you will solve all other problems thereby. There is a pause as I try to digest his answer. From the square framed and barred hole in the wall which does duty as a window, as it does in so many Indian buildings, I obtain a fine view of the lower slopes of the sacred hill. Its strange outline is bathed in the early morning light. The Maharishi addresses me again. Would it be clear if it is put in this way? All human beings are ever wanting happiness, untainted with sorrow. They want to grasp a happiness which will not come to an end. The instinct is a true one. But have you ever been struck by the fact that they love their own selves most? Well, now relate that to the fact that they are ever desirous of attaining happiness through one means or another, through drink or through religion, and you are provided with a clue to the real nature of man. I fail to see. The tone of his voice becomes higher. Man's real nature is happiness. Happiness is inborn in the true self. His search for happiness is an unconscious search for his true self. The true self is imperishable. Therefore, when a man finds it, he finds a happiness which does not come to an end. But the world is so unhappy. Yes, but that is because the world is ignorant of its true self. All men, without exception, are consciously or unconsciously seeking for it. Even the wicked, the brutal, and the criminal, I ask, even they sin because they are trying to find the self's happiness in every sin which they commit. This striving is instinctive in man, but they do not know that they are really seeking their true selves and so they try these wicked ways first as a means to happiness. Of course, there are wrong ways, for a man's acts are reflected back to him. So we shall feel lasting happiness when we know this true self. The other nods his head. A slanting ray of sunshine falls through the unglazed window upon the Maharishi's face. There is serenity in that unruffled brow. There is contentment around the firm mouth. There is a shrine-like peace in those lustrous eyes. His online countenance does not belie his revelatory words. What does the Maharishi mean by these apparently simple sentences? The interpreter has conveyed their outward meaning to me in English, yes. But there is a deeper purport which he cannot convey. 
I know that I must discover that for myself. The sage seems to speak not as a philosopher, not as a pundit trying to explain his own doctrine, but rather out of the depth of his own heart. Are these words the marks of his own fortunate experience? What exactly is this self of which you speak? If what you say is true, then there must be another self in man. His lips curve in a smile for a moment. Can a man be possessed of two identities, two selves? He makes answer. To understand this matter, it is first necessary for a man to analyze himself. Because it has long been his habit to think as others think, he has never faced his I in the true manner. He is not a correct picture of himself. He has too long identified himself with the body and the brain. Therefore, I tell you to pursue this inquiry. Who am I? He pauses to let these words soak into me. I listen eagerly to his next sentences. You ask me to describe this true self to you. What can be said? It is that out of which the sense of the personal I arises, and into which it shall have to disappear. Disappear? I echo back. How can one lose the feeling of one's personality? The first and foremost of all thoughts, the primeval thought in the mind of every man, is the thought I. It is only after the birth of this thought that any other thoughts can arise at all. It is only after the first personal pronoun, I, has arisen in the mind, that the second personal pronoun, you, can make its appearance. If you could mentally follow the I thread until it leads you back to its source, you would discover that just as it is the first thought to appear, so it is the last to disappear. This is a matter which can be experienced. You mean that it is perfectly possible to conduct such a mental investigation into oneself? Assuredly, it is possible to go inwards until the last thought I gradually vanishes. What is left? I query. Will a man then become quite unconscious, or will he become an idiot? Not so. On the contrary, he will attain that consciousness which is immortal, and he will become truly wise when he has awakened to his true self, which is the real nature of man. But surely the sense of I must also pertain to that, I persist. The sense of I pertains to the person, the body, and brain, replies the Maharishi calmly. When a man knows his true self for the first time, something else arises from the depths of his being and takes possession of him. That something is behind the mind. It is infinite, divine, eternal. Some people call it the kingdom of heaven. Others call it the soul. Still others name it nirvana, and we Hindus call it liberation. You may give it what name you wish. When this happens, a man has not really lost himself, rather, he has found himself. As the last word falls from the interpreter's lips, there flashes across my mind those memorable words which were uttered by a wandering teacher in Galilee, words which have puzzled so many good persons. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. How strangely similar! are the two sentences. Yet the Indian sage has arrived at the thought in his own non-Christian way, to a psychological path which seems exceedingly difficult and appears unfamiliar. The Maharishi speaks again, his words breaking into my thoughts. Unless and until a man embarks upon this quest of the true self, doubt and uncertainty will follow his footsteps throughout life. The greatest kings and statesmen try to rule others, when in their heart of hearts they know that they cannot rule themselves. Yet the greatest power is at the command of a man who has penetrated to his inmost depth. There are men of giant intellects who spend their lives gathering knowledge about many things. Ask these men if they have solved the mystery of man, if they have conquered themselves and they will hang their heads in shame. What is the use of knowing about everything else when you do not yet know who you are? Men avoid this inquiry into the true self, but what else is there so worthy to be undertaken? That is such a difficult, a superhuman task, I comment. 
The sage gives an almost imperceptible shrug of his shoulders. The question of its possibility is a matter of one's own experience. The difficulty is less than you think. For us who are active, practical Westerners, such introspections, I begin doubtfully and leave my sentence trailing in midair. The Maharishi bends down to light a fresh joss stick, which will replace one whose red spark is dying out. The realization of truth is the same both for Indians and Europeans. Admittedly, the way to it may be harder for those who are engrossed in worldly life, but even then one can and must conquer. The current induced during meditation can be kept up by habit, by practicing to do so. Then one can perform his work and activities in that very current itself. There will be no break. Thus, there will be no difference between meditation and external activities. If you meditate on this question, who am I? If you begin to perceive that neither the body nor the brain nor the desires are really you, then the very attitude of inquiry will eventually draw the answer to you out of the depths of your own being. It will come to you of its own accord as a deep realization. Again, I ponder his words. No, the real self, he continues, and then truth will shine forth within your heart like sunshine. The mind will become untroubled and real happiness will flood it. For happiness and the true self are identical. You will have no more doubt once you attain this self-awareness. He turns his head and fixes his gaze at the far end of the hall. I know then that he has reached his conversational limit. Thus ends our last talk. And I congratulate myself that I have drawn him out of the shell of taciturnity before my departure. I leave him and wander away to a quiet spot in the jungle, where I spend most of the day among my notes and books. When dust falls, I return to the hall, for within an hour or two, a pony carriage or bullock cart will arrive to bear me away from the hermitage. The burning incense makes the air odorous. The Maharishi has been half reclining under the waving punka as I entered, but he soon sits up and assumes his favorite attitude. He sits with legs crossed, the right foot placed on the left thigh, and the left foot merely folded beneath the right thigh. I remember being shown a similar position by Brahma, the yogi who lives near Madras, who called it the comfortable posture. It is really a half-Buddha posture and quite easy to do. The Maharishi, as is his wont, holds his chin with his right hand and rests the elbow on a knee. Next he gazes attentively at me but remains quite silent. On the floor beside him I notice his gourd shell water jug and his bamboo staff. And they are his sole earthly possessions, apart from the strip of loincloth. What a mute commentary on our Western spirit of acquisitiveness. His eyes, always shining, steadily become more glazed and fixed. His body sets into a rigid pose. His head trembles slightly and then comes to rest. A few more minutes and I can plainly see that he has re-entered the trance-like condition in which he was when I first met him. How strange that our parting shall repeat our meeting. Someone brings his face close to mine and whispers in my ear, The Maharishi has gone into holy trance. It is useless now to talk. A hush falls upon the little company. The minutes slowly pass, but the silence only deepens. I am not religious, but I can no more resist the feeling of increasing awe, which begins to grip my mind than a bee can resist a flower in all its luscious bloom. The hall is becoming pervaded with a subtle, intangible, and indefinable power which affects me deeply. I feel without doubt and without hesitation that the center of this mysterious power is no other than the Maharishi himself. His eyes shine with astonishing brilliance. Strange sensations begin to arise in me. Those lustrous orbs seem to be peering into the inmost recesses of my soul. In a peculiar way, I feel aware of everything he can see in my heart. His mysterious glance penetrates my thoughts, my emotions, and my desires. I am helpless before it. 
At first, his disconcerting gaze troubles me. I become vaguely uneasy. I feel that he has perceived pages that belong to a past which I have forgotten. He knows it all, I am certain. I am powerless to escape. Somehow, I do not want to either. Some curious intimation of future benefit forces me to endure that pitiless gaze. And so he continues to catch the feeble quality of my soul for a while, to perceive my motley past, to sense the mixed emotions which have drawn me this way and that. But I feel that he understands also what mind-devastating quest has impelled me to leave the common way and seek out such men as he. There comes a perceptible change in the telepathic current which plays between us. The while my eyes blink frequently, but his remain without the least tremor. I become aware that he is definitely linking my own mind with his, that he is provoking my heart into that state of starry calm, which he seems perpetually to enjoy. In this extraordinary peace I find a sense of exultation and lightness. Time seems to stand still. My heart is released from its burden of care. Never again, I feel, shall the bitterness of anger and the melancholy of unsatisfied desire afflict me. I realize deeply that the profound instinct which is innate in the race, which bids man look up, which encourages him to hope on, and which sustains him when life has darkened, is a true instinct, for the essence of being is good. In this beautiful and trance silence, when the clock stands still and the sorrows and airs of the past seem like trivialities, my mind is being submerged in that of the Maharishi, and wisdom is now at its perihelion. What is this man's gaze but a thaumaturgic wand, which evokes a hidden world of unexpected splendor before my profane eyes? I have sometimes asked myself why these disciples have been staying around the sage for years, with few conversations, fewer comforts, and no external activities to attract them. Now I begin to understand, not by thought but by lightning-like illumination, that through all those years they have been receiving a deep and silent reward. Hitherto everyone in the hall has been hushed to a death-like stillness. At length someone quietly rises and passes out. He is followed by another, and then another, until all have gone. I am alone with the Maharishi. Never before has this happened. His eyes begin to change. They narrow down to pinpoints. The effect is curiously like the stopping down in the focus of a camera lens. Then comes a tremendous increase in the intense gleam which shines between the lids now almost closed. Suddenly my body seems to disappear and we are both out in space. It is a crucial moment. I hesitate and decide to break this enchanter's spell. Decision brings power and once again I am back in the flesh, back in the hole. No word passes from him to me. I collect my faculties, look at the clock, and rise quietly. The hour of departure has arrived. I bow my head in farewell. The sage silently acknowledges the gesture. I utter a few words of thanks. Again, he silently nods his head. I linger reluctantly at the threshold. Outside, I hear the tinkle of a bell. The bullock cart has arrived. Once more, I raise my hands, palms touching. And so we part.